Hi everyone, it's Pastor Wagner. This is my weekly video blog. Today I want to talk about Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 and see whose faith it is by which we are saved. I received a comment on one of my other videos this week and the comment said maybe you'll do a video examining the words of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And I thought that was a good idea. I'm not sure if the comment was made uh, sarcastically or not, but nevertheless, it's a good idea. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 states, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now this verse is often quoted by professing Christians, but unfortunately it's just about as often misunderstood and misinterpreted. When most Christians read, most professing Christians, when they read Ephesians 2.8, they hear something like this. For by grace are you saved through your faith. And only the grace is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You see, they read things into it. When they say, when they read, for by grace you saved through faith, they automatically assume that's speaking of our faith. And they forget what the rest of the verse says and what the next verse says. So does, what does Ephesians 2, 8 actually say? What it actually says that for by grace you saved through faith in that not of yourselves. The, the, when it says, in that not of yourselves, the thing that was just prior to that is faith. So to jump over faith and say, oh, it's only the grace that's not of yourselves, but the faith is of yourselves, is not a correct reading of the text, is it? But there are three reasons I'm going to give you why the faith is not of ourselves, just like the verse says. You see, it's the grace and the faith that's not of ourselves. The whole salvation package from start to finish when God eternally saves a person from their sins is not of yourselves. Here's the first reason. If you look at the context of the verse, which is important, you always want to go back, read the previous verses to it. If you just start in the beginning of the chapter, in chapter 2, and just read the context, you will see quickly that Paul states that when we were saved by grace, we were dead in trespasses and in sins. That's what it says in Ephesians 2 5. It says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with him or with Christ, by grace ye are saved. There's a parallel text to Ephesians 2 8, and it says, We were dead in sins when God saved us by his grace. Dead means that has ceased to live, deprived of life in that state in which the vital functions and powers have come to an end and are incapable of being restored. It's destitute of spiritual life or energy. In that definition, the Bible is quoted to, to use that, de that definition. A reference of that definition is the Bible itself in Ephesians 2 and verse 1. Destitute of spiritual life or energy. It says that we were quickened when we were dead in sins. This is how God saved us. By grace are you saved, he says. To quicken means to give or restore life to, to make alive, to vivify, to revive, to animate as the soul, the body. So God here is telling you in two different ways that man was dead, destitute of spiritual life and energy, and incapable of restoring himself to life when God saved him by his grace. The Bible says that Christ died for us when we were without strength. Ephesians, or Romans 5 and verse 6. And the Bible says that the gospel is foolishness to them who perish. Perish means to incur spiritual death, be lost. So to the person who is dead in sins, the gospel's foolishness to him. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18, it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. So if the faith in Ephesians 2.8 is taken to be our faith, well, it would be our faith in the preaching of the cross. When we hear the gospel, it's our faith in the good news of what Christ did for us. And this is said to save us eternally. The only problem is, 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The preaching of the cross is to them that perish, to them who are dead in sins. It is foolishness. They cannot understand it. They cannot believe it. So there's no way that the faith in Ephesians 2.8, by which we are saved eternally, is speaking of our faith because we can't believe the gospel in our natural state apart from the grace of God before we're saved by grace and given eternal life. 
So therefore the faith through which we are saved cannot be our own. That's the first reason. Let me give you another reason. Number two. At the time that God saved us by his grace, we were natural men. It says in Ephesians 2 and verse 2 that we walked according to the course of this world. And in Ephesians 2, 3, that we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So we were natural men, dead in sins, walking according to the course of this world. We are not subject to the law of God. Here's the problem. Ephes not Ephesians. 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that in that state that the natural man is in, he cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man, this is the guy that's not saved by the grace of God, this is the guy that's in his sins naturally, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. Ephesians 2.8 cannot be speaking of your faith by which you're saved eternally because the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God, like the gospel. He doesn't receive those things. He cannot receive them. So therefore, the faith through which we are saved cannot be our own. Let me give you a third reason why the faith cannot be our own. It says in Ephesians 2 and verse 3 that at the time that God saved us by his grace, it says we were in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were carnal men, fleshly men. We were not spiritual men when God saved us. This is the very context of Ephesians 2 and verse 8. But it says in Romans 8 and verse 5, they that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, not the things of the spirit. So when you're in the flesh, you don't mind the things of the Spirit. You don't care about the things of the Spirit. You're not having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't. You're dead in sins. It says in Romans 6 and verse 8, to be carnally minded is death. Carnal is of or pertaining to the flesh or the body, bodily, corporeal. It's not spiritual. In a private of sense, unregenerate, unsanctified, worldly. We're talking about the unregenerate, the unsaved, when we talk about the carnal mind here. It says in Romans 8 and verse 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. This is the state of the people that Paul is speaking of here in Ephesians chapter 2. They were in the flesh. They were, they were fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. They were carnal men. And Paul says here that the carnal mind is enmity against God. He's not having faith in God to get saved He's at enmity against God. He's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. You see? Romans 8 and verse 8 says, They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, what, is, what, what pleases God? What is one thing that pleases God more than anything else? It's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told that in 1 John 3 and verse 22 that we do those things which are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. It is pleasing to God to believe on Jesus Christ. But yet Paul says that they, they're in, they that are in the flesh can not please God. In other words, they that are in the flesh, they that are fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, like Paul says in Ephesians 2, 3, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. In other words, they cannot believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because that is something that pleases God. So therefore, the faith through which we are saved in Ephesians 2, 8 is not our faith. That's why Paul says it is not of yourselves. Let me give you one more reason. Actually, I just gave you the three. <laughs> Let me give you the next point. So you might want to, you, you're probably wondering then, well, then whose faith is it? After all, we're the only ones in the universe that can have faith, right? Whose faith did save us? If it's not our faith who saved us, then whose faith was it? It was the faith of Jesus Christ. Not your faith in Jesus Christ, like these modern perversions of the Bible teach, like the NIV and the ESV and all these other filthy abominations. It is the faith of Jesus Christ. It's his faith that saved us. We're told as much in Galatians 2 and verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. 
and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We're not justified by our faith in Christ. We're justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. It's his faith. We're told in Romans 3, 22 and Philippians 3, 9 that the righteousness of God is by faith of Jesus Christ. Get yourself a King James Bible. Look up Galatians 2, 16, Romans 3, 22, Philippians 3, 9. It's the faith of Jesus Christ, not faith in Jesus Christ. It's not your faith. It's his faith that saved us. You might say, well, how did Jesus have faith? He's God, right? Well, I've done a whole sermon on the faith of Christ. You, I put that in the notes of this video if I remember. But the faith that saved us was the faith, well, many acts of faith that Jesus did. He said he always did those things which pleased the Father. And without faith, it's impossible to please him, we're told in, in Hebrews 11 and verse 6. So every everything that he did in his life was an act of faith. But his ultimate act of faith is whenever he hung on that cross and he said, Father, into thy hands commend I my spirit. In Luke 23 and verse 46. To commend means to give and trust or charge, deliver to one's care, keeping to commit and trust. It means it's committal of divine to the divine keeping to commit with a prayer or act of faith to deliver up with confidence. When Jesus hung on that cross and he committed his soul to God, he was giving the keeping of his soul to God in faith because God had forsaken him and all he had left was his faith to believe that the Father would not forsake him, would not cast his soul into hell, but that he would resurrect him from the dead and he would be ascended up on high and he would be the ruler and king of the universe. He had faith that God was going to resurrect him from the dead and accept his sacrifice. And it was by that faith that saved us. That is the faith of Christ. That is the faith by grace, where it says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It was Christ's faith that saved us, not our faith. But furthermore, what does the next verse say? It's always a good idea to take a look at the next verse. Everybody loves Ephesians 2.8. How about Ephesians 2.9? It says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. This further confirms that the faith in verse 8 is not of ourselves because it's not of works. You see, works are something that a man does. Here's the definition for you, Oxford English Dictionary. Work is something that is or was done what a person does or did in act, deed, proceeding, or business. So a work is anything that you do, right? Well, then that tells us that faith is a work because faith is something you do. How do I know that? How about Matthew 23, 23? Jesus said, Woe unto you Pharisees, for you pay mint of tithe, or for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to have left the other undone. Jesus says that the weightier matters of the law are judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done. You ought to have done, have done the weightier matters of the law, one of which is faith. Faith is a weighty matter of the law. Faith is a work. It's something you do. We're told, we are told that plainly in 1 Thessalonians 1.3. Remembering your work of faith, Paul says. And Jesus told the disciples plainly that faith was a work. In John 6, 28 and 29, they said, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus says, This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he hath sent. You want to do the work of God? Here's the work of God. Believe on Jesus Christ. That's a work. And anybody that's ever done it knows it's a work. It's a lot of work, isn't it? Remember the one disciple of Jesus said, the one follower of Jesus said that I believe, help thou mine unbelief. It's work. To believe in Jesus Christ. You have to endure persecution and affliction. You have to endure doubts. It's work. But we're not saved by works, are we? We're not saved by our personal faith. Number one, because you can't even have faith in Christ until you're saved by the grace of God. You have to have eternal life to even have faith in the beginning, in the first place, because otherwise you're dead. You can't have faith. And furthermore, if faith is not a work, if believing is not a work, why do we tell men to do it? Don't we tell people, isn't a commandment of the, God, of the gospel to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? That's a commandment. Why would God tell us to do something if faith is not a work? Why would, he, why would he tell us to believe if faith is not a work? Remember, work is something that you do. Furthermore, we know that our faith, we know that it's not our faith that saved us eternally because 
it's not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, if it was our faith that saved us eternally, we would have something to boast about, wouldn't we? Because if it was our faith, then we could say, hey, we took part in this thing, right? We could take some credit for our eternal salvation because after all, God could not have done it without us. Remember, I mean, the, the Arminian line is that God wants to save everybody and he, he may, he, you know, he, Jesus Christ was sacrificed as some potential offering for every man and then if men will just accept it, then God will save him, you know, that his faith he, t he somehow his faith is conditioned, his salvation is conditioned upon his faith. You see, if that was true, man could take credit for his faith because God, according to the Arminians, could not save you without your consent. Without your personal faith, God cannot save you, according to the Arminians. So you could take some credit for that. You could boast and say, hey, I'm in heaven right now because I had personal faith in Jesus Christ and those poor suckers in hell, they're not there because they didn't have faith. I had faith and I'm here. You guys didn't have faith and that's why you're down there. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of your own personal faith. It is by the faith of Jesus Christ that we're saved. So thank you to the person who asked me to do the, the video on Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I hope this was of some benefit to you. I'll talk to you again next week, Lord willing.